Hey, what's up everybody? It's Mike here. I'm back with another video. What do you think about my uh, new background here? I think it's pretty cool. So first of all, I'd like to congratulate everyone over at NASA for the successful launch of Space Shuttle Discovery over on Thursday. Uh, what a great launch. It's great to see the bird up in the air finally after all these delays ever since November. But I just want to wish uh, an overall congratulations to everyone who was involved with this successful launch and making sure that it was safe. And there was quite a bit of drama there right at the end, and they literally launched right at the last second. Now, there was a piece of foam that did hit the space shuttle on its way up, but it hit the space shuttle after uh, the max Q, which is where the atmospheric pressure becomes a lot weaker, and there's not as much stress on the vehicle. And because of that, when uh, that piece of foam hit the vehicle, uh, it wasn't as much of a big deal um, because of that. And NASA's pretty much ruled it out as being a threat, but, you know, to play it safe, they did uh, do an inspection when they first got to orbit, and then when they first approached the space station, they did this uh, flip-over maneuver where they literally flip all the way over, and someone from uh, inside the space station is able to uh, check it out and of course they're videoing it and everything like that um, and as far I haven't heard what the results are of the two inspections but uh, NASA is pretty much saying they're not worried about it and that it's not a threat and that landing should go smoothly so I'm glad that their plane is safe and making sure that there's no problems and that everything is going to go smoothly and again congratulations to everyone for NASA for accomplishing this now there's something really cool about uh, this particular mission. This is the first time that we're going to have uh, a vehicle from uh, four of the space uh, faring nations docked at the International Space Station all at the same time. The, the Space Shuttle, uh, Russian Soyuz manned and Progress unmanned cargo vessel, European ATV cargo vessel unmanned, and the Japanese HTV unmanned cargo vessel. And they want to stage like, a really cool photo op to uh, take a picture of the entire space station with all the uh, uh, vehicles docked all at the same time, and there's two Soyuz docked right now, so they could pull one of them, uh, undock, and you know get to whatever position they need to do to get the right angle and the right picture and everything. And I think that's a great idea. I hope they do it, and I hope that they get some great footage from it. That would be a really uh, iconic picture of of you know the space station up to this point and, and uh, what we've accomplished so far. Anyway, great idea, and congrats to everyone. I hope you do the whole photo op idea. Now, some other cool things about Space Shuttle Discovery's mission is it's going to be installing a uh, multi-purpose logistics module, which is like a storage room, closet, whatever you want to call it, uh, permanently to the International Space Station, uh, which, you know, it's, that's a good idea, you know, have the extra room, especially since they have so many extra supplies right now, and since the Space Shuttle is going to be retiring after two more launches. Uh, but another cool thing about this mission is uh, on the Space Shuttle Discovery, uh, there's going to be another Dragon Eye, which is the uh, LIDAR uh, docking sensor uh, for SpaceX, which is going to be used for their Dragon capsules to dock and approach the International Space Station. Now, the Dragon Eye sensor has flown before on uh, STS-127, and uh, also their uh, ultra-high-frequency communication uh, radio device flew on STS-129. Now, uh, I've mentioned in another video about how NASA wanted them to do more tests with the LIDAR sensor. And what I'm wondering is if this particular mission with uh, 133 uh, is fulfilling what NASA is asking for, or if they do need to still do more tests here on the ground and uh, do another uh, launch, maybe with another Dragon Eye on this upcoming COTS mission that they're going to be doing or something like that. I don't know. If any of you guys have any information, uh, let me know, because I'd like to know whether or not that uh, this Dragon Eye will fulfill that uh, what NASA has asked for and get them another milestone payment. Now, I want to talk about a really cool proposal that has just come out uh, with uh, some engineers who work for NASA over the Ames Research Center. And uh, it's a really cool, really cool idea. But before I talk about it, I, I, I feel like I have to give a little bit of a back history. There have been lots of different modules and parts to the International Space Station that have been canceled over the years due to funding or going over budget or, or uh, be late on uh, their delivery of, of certain pieces. Anyway, all sorts of different things that go into why things are canceled. But uh, one of those particular pieces that were canceled was called the Habitation Module, which was going to be uh, pretty much quarters for the crew, you know, and have their own little personal space to sleep and to spend some time, and also have, you know, a, a shower for the entire crew and maybe a spot to gather you know to to have meals and whatnot 
uh, and that was cancelled and the module uh, that was going to be the habitation module was fully built and back on February 14th of 2006 it was converted into a ground-based uh, uh, life support system research module. Now the whole time that the habitation module was being developed they were studying other ideas just in case uh, it got cancelled or in case it wasn't uh, gonna work out for whatever reason. NASA is very famous for having lots of backup plans. Anyway one of those ideas was called the TransHab. This is the TransHab. Uh, it's an inflatable space station module that uh, isn't as large as we see here at first. It's all stuffed up into a smaller module, which you can see in the middle there, the core module, which has the green and the blue at the bottom and top, respectively. Uh, all of that's cramped inside of there, and uh, once it gets to space, it inflates to the size that we see here. Most of the modules on the space station are about the size of that inner core module, so this give, would give a huge amount of space that is needed. As you can see here, th this would be the protection, a multi-layered system to protect uh, these inflatable modules from micrometeorites, especially the Kevlar you see there would be the best. So the habitation module that the TransHab was being developed to replace eventually got cancelled in 2005 after the uh, uh, Columbia disaster and lots of other factors, one of which being that the crew return vehicle that was originally planned got cancelled because they favored having two Soyuz docked at the station instead of having the, the, this new crew return vehicle. It was also over budget and uh, delayed. Anyways, um, before the habitation module even got cancelled, which got cancelled back in 2005, uh, the TransHab, which was the inflatable, got cancelled way before that, back in 1999. And just like the, the Constellation program is taking such a, uh, a long time to get wrapped up, I, I suppose, uh, the same thing happened with TransHab. And it wasn't officially till 2000 that it was, you know, finally Congress outlawed NASA from developing that technology any further. Now enter Bigelow Aerospace. Bigelow Aerospace was started in 1998 by Robert Bigelow, who is a contractor and a hotel chain owner. I'm not sure at the time that he started his company what he had in mind to do for his designs, but uh, uh, two years later, in 2000, when the TransHab program was officially canceled by Congress, Robert Bigelow, through three Space Act agreements, bought uh, the patent rights to the inflatable TransHab technology and also made it so that his company would be the sole company that could commercialize the rights to these patents and started the further development of the technology with Bigelow Aerospace. And they added an extra protective layer to the design called Vectran, which is pretty much double strength Kevlar. And they also developed their own solar panels, and as you can see in this photo here, their power bus, which has the thrusters to be able to maneuver around and to make sure it doesn't get pulled, sucked into the Earth's gravity. Um, which can be seen better here, um, over there to the left. And also you can see that it's connected to the docking hub, uh, where the modules and visiting spacecraft will uh, dock at. Those pieces are what's going to make space stations like this possible. Now, as far as I know, that propulsion bus and uh, docking hub aren't constructed as far as I know, but they may already have a few of them. Um, what they're mainly working on is developing the inflatable technology and having the Vectran uh, layer added to and just be able to do the whole process. Now, on July 12, 2006, they launched their first subscale model, the Genesis 1. And uh, everything was a complete success, it inflated like it was supposed to, and everything worked out great. And uh, it's still on orbit right now, it, and I believe that it's still working, and everything's going great with it. And it did so well that their next model up that they were going to do, like, uh, imagine the Genesis is like a one-quarter size of um, the full-scale model. And the next thing that they were going to do was going to be called their Guardian, which was going to be like 45% the size. And they decided to cancel that in late 2006 because the Genesis 1 did so well. Here's a cutaway of the Genesis 1, and you can see the inner column in there uh, would be the size that it would be when you put it on top of a rocket. And they happened to put it on top of a pretty small Russian rocket. And on June 28, 2007, the Genesis 2 module was launched. 
And uh, I'm not sure if this uh, picture here is entirely accurate on the size comparison because uh, the Genesis was only supposed to be a quarter, whereas the, that next module there, the Galaxy module, was supposed to be 50%. Now, once again, because the Genesis 2 module did so well, uh, they decided to cancel the Galaxy module. But uh, instead of like the Guardian module that what didn't exist yet, they had actually built the Galaxy module, and so they decided to use it as a ground-based test module to test out whatever kind of technologies they can here, probably life support and other things like that. Their next plan is to make the Sun Dancer, which you see there, which is going to be half the size of their normal module, and the regular module, the commercial one, is going to be the BA330, which stands for 330 cubic meters, which you can see in this chart has all the uh, interior volume of what it would be in a space station like this, how much interior volume it would have versus how much it would be in the space station, the International Space Station. But first you have to get it there, and right now Bigelow Aerospace is uh, requesting the Falcon 9 rocket from SpaceX to be launched sometime in 2014. Now uh, whether or not that's going to be a Sundancer module or a BA-330, uh, no one knows because neither company has stated what the payload is going to be for that particular launch. But in the meantime, none of these cool photos that I'm showing you are going to exist until this module, the Sundancer, is put into orbit. And right now they're working on it. I'm not sure if they have it completed yet or not, but uh, they did put a major addition to their facilities in Las Vegas where they're based so that they can go from uh, R&D and design to full-on mass production. So uh, they're going to be launching their Sundancer module sometime soon. And uh, the only reason that they haven't launched it anytime sooner is because of a, a lack of availability of crew transport and cargo transport even to go to just the Sundancer module. Now because of this problem, Bigelow has been seeking partnerships with other companies and eventually found a good partnership they liked with Boeing. And Boeing has announced their own uh, commercial bid for a crewed capsule, which could be launched either on their Delta uh, IV Heavy or uh, an Atlas V with their partnership through United Launch Lines. Boeing's partnership with Lockheed to make United Launch Lines, that is. And this is the uh, Boeing's capsule that they want to make. It's called the CST-100, and uh, they're wanting it to, to bid for American astronauts to be sent to the International Space Station, and then also to be used for the first crewed visits to the Sundancer module, which will eventually become Space Station Alpha. And there's lots of other mission profiles for the CST-100, which uh, I'll probably talk about in another video where I'm going to do more of a profile specifically on Boeing. But as far as this partnership goes, that's who is the biggest partner with Bigelow Aerospace right now in order to send crew to uh, the space stations that they would have set up in orbit. And Bigelow wants to set up two space stations in orbit, uh, Space Station Alpha and Beta. Uh, one of which will be combined of two Sun Dancers and one BA-33. And the other, I think, would be all BA-330s. Now, uh, for the sake of the timing of this video, I'm going to split it up into two parts at this point. Because there's really a lot of cool things that Bigelow Aerospace wants to do and has been proposing. And I want to go through every single one of these plans. I mean, just these inflatable modules... Uh, uh, by themselves. If we only get a Sun Dancer up in orbit, that would be awesome. And if it gets visited by one of these CST-100s, that would be awesome. And if it gets delivered some cargo by a Dragon capsule or even a Cygnus capsule, which Bigelow has said, they're very open to that. They are very open to other companies being able to um, do what they need to be able to send crew and send supplies uh, to the, the inflatable stations. It's just that Boeing is the one that they've developed the, the most of a friendship with at this point but if any other companies are capable of doing it by all means they want it to happen and they will be purchasing those services now the whole reason that I'm telling you all this other than the fact that it's freaking cool is leading up to this proposal of all proposals that I want to talk about in uh, the next video and that's the Nautilus X uh, please comment and ask me any questions or anything you liked or didn't like about it let me know what you think about the background let me know what you think about the beats that uh, you've been hearing this whole time I, I made all of those myself so uh, tell me what you think and uh, thank you for tuning into this and I'll see you next time.